everyone and welcome back to the Dwarven Tigs mini meta series. Today our tour will take us to the depths of Autan Tig. This tig ranks among the most interesting of all the Dwarven lore we have, and yes, I'm including the strange locations of Cal Rapatha and Hedron Tig in that number. The reason for this is simple. Despite the fact that we arguably have more literature and exposure to Autan Tig than any other tig in Thedas, each piece of information we learn reinforces that when it comes to Autan Tig, we cannot ever know everything. Ortan is a mystery, one of the greatest in the Deep Roads, because the more we learn about this location, its history, its law, and its people, the more questions we have, and we never get those answers. But that does not mean we will not try, so today's goal is to explore the breadth of our knowledge about this tag, which goes far beyond the simple exploration during the Paragon of her kind questline in Dragon Age Origins. What we know of Ortan Tag extends from the memories of Orzammar to the knowledge of the Legion of the Dead, from noble smiths, merchants and castles living now in Orzammar and on the surface, and from the experiences of Marek Theron in both the Stolen Throne and the Calling, and from the historical records of Paragons like Caradin, who called Ortan Tag home. Ortan Tig potentially numbers among the oldest and most vibrant of the Dwarven Tigs, falling long after most of the other Tigs, lasting until as late as the Fourth Blight in the Exalted Age, sometime between 512 and 524 Exalted. We're not sure precisely when it was founded, but this is definitely earlier than the First Blight, because Paragon Caradin was born in this Tig. We'll get back to Caradin in a moment, as he's not the only famous dwarf to come from this tag. Kalana Orton, a warrior, was training in Ozma when the tag was lost, and from her line, House Orton continues. Paragon Orton was responsible for composing the grand epic of the Seven Brothers, the legend of the foundation of the Dwarven Kingdom, and for his work in the creation of the Ortanic Symphony. This fame is reinforced in the architecture and structures we see in the Tig, which features stages and amphitheatres among its many ruins, too small to be proving grounds. Ortan Tig is full of massive artistic feats, including great paintings, some of the largest paragon statues known to the dwarves to date, and also armories dedicated to the crafting and rune inscribing of weaponry, complete with a forge capable of handling dragon bone, a skill the dwarves lost centuries ago. That forge may even have been the birthplace of King Marek Theron's sword, a dragonbone blade with runes so powerful they can actually repel the blight, which was found only a few hours distance from the Tig in the corridors of the Deep Roads on the body of a fallen dwarf. These smithing roots are the ones that most people attribute to Autan Tig today, thanks to the well-known Paragon Caradin, who was responsible for the Anvil of the Void and the recreation of Golems in Minus 255 Ancient. Ortan Tag did boast powerful military might. It outlasted the Darkspawn until the Fourth Blight, when much of the Dwarven Kingdom had fallen centuries earlier. But its true strength was not in its warriors, but in its artists. The Anvil of the Void was only one of many inventions to come from this Tag, which was itself a wonder beyond comprehension. And the reason for this is that Ortan Tag is far larger than the areas we can visit in Dragon Age Origins. Reports of those who have crossed the Tig claim it takes hours upon hours to journey through the city. At its height, Ortan Tig boasted giant palaces, armory workshops, vast promenades complete with functional fountains, great golden domed amphitheatres, its river with the banks crisscrossed by bridges guarded by paragons, giant galleries behind great bronze doors, archways, estates, and plazas. This was a focal point of creation for the Dwarves, birthplaces of paragons and new ideas, but these ideas were not themselves attributed to the Dwarves, but to the ancestors. Caradin himself admits in his journal that he did not invent golems, but was given vision from the ancestors that he brought to fruition using rocks and lyrium, and that even the name Golem was a callback to earlier Dwarven legends, likely of rock wraiths and titanic guardians. Ortan Tig, based on information from the Stolen Throne, is located in the vicinity of the Ferelden town of West Hill, which puts it underneath the northwestern Benorn, close to the Storm Coast. The relevance of this information is significant, as there are other Tigs of great importance in this region, and it allows us to orient our map in the Deep Roads to get a fuller picture of the layout beneath the surface. Here we see the likes of Kadash Tig, so old it was built upon the ruins of ancient Kadalash, and dates to before the time of Arlathan's fall and to the Forgotten Wars against the Scaled Ones that took place in and around the region of Hedron Tig, another of Ortan's neighbours. Hedron is the site of an ancient titan, and while we won't discuss the particulars in this video, it is worth mentioning that the presence of a titan at Hedron Tig adds significant information when attempting to date surrounding Tigs. Whenever Paragon Ortan lived, it was definitely prior to the Blight, when Hedron and Kadash and Kalharal were all bustling with life, and because of the presence of the titan, it makes sense for inventions like like the Anvil of the Void, a combination of lyrium enchantment and smithing, 
as well as dragonbone forges and other artistic great works to take place here. If Caradon speaks of the ancestors giving him visions that led to the creation of golems, then this is because of Ortantai's close proximity to the Hedron Titan, an influential factor in all the creations from this taig. Dating Ortantai is almost impossible without additional specific records, but given the proximity to taigs like Hedron and Kadash, both of which feature ancient elven artifacts and statues, like that of Mithal in the Bastion of the Pure at Hedron Taig, and the lights of Arlathan hidden in Kadash, we can presume Ortan to be incredibly old. And for those who doubt that this information can be surmised, there is evidence within Ortan Taig itself that links to ancient elves, which brings us to Ortan's other great mystery, its magic. Ortan Taig has an incredibly weak veil. We know this because Ortan Taig by the Dragon Age is infested with giant corrupted spiders, and even after they are burned out by Loge and Maktir in 899 Blessed, they return by 930 Dragon and once again rule the Taig. The corruption of these spiders comes from hunting and consuming the Darkspawn, but the size itself is the important part here. Giant spiders grow because of weak veils, either because the fade itself taints them and causes them to grow unnaturally large, or because they may even be spiritually or demonically possessed. The fact Ortan Taig draws these creatures which appear where the veil is thinnest suggests Ortan Taig has a very thin veil, and this is likely not simply due to the Darkspawn, though great battlefields of bones do still litter this Taig. The reason the veil is likely thinner here is because Ortan is inundated with magic. There are simple things, like functional dwemers that created running water for the inhabitants of ancient houses, as seen in the stolen throne. There's a large basin in the back, he pointed towards the area on the far side of the room where the wall was more crumbled than elsewhere, that seems to generate fresh water on its own. It was turned over and had made a creek. Magic, obviously, Rowan offered, but it's fresh. Too bad we can't take it with us. This sort of magic is simplistic, though, compared to the more sinister magics that are intricately linked with the Taig. In fact, the Darkspawn may not have had the chance to fully overrun the Taig before the Dwarfs did themselves in. The next part is in the lore, but it will leave you with more questions and answers, as in Autan we are given the only recent example, aside from Valta in the Descent DLC, of a Dwarf actually using magic. The following excerpt is from The Calling, pages 256 to 259. Beyond the doors lay a round, domed chamber. The first thing Duncan noticed was the throne that sat at the stone dais on the centre of it. The second thing was the sea of skeletons. They were dwarves, all of them, a layer of bones so thick it was impossible to see the floor. The dais itself was bare, but one lone skeleton sat on that throne, a single silent witness to the carnage, now covered in a layer of dust. The skeletons in the room were thickest near the doors. At first, his assumption had been simply that the dwarves had been fighting the Darkspawn as they burst through the doors, the last-ditch defence of their dwarven ruler. But where were the Darkspawn corpses inside the throne room? There were none. He noticed that only some of them still had weapons, now rusted and useless. The rest of them had nothing. Outside in the gallery, the skeletons were all still holding their blades, or their blades were nearby but in here the weapons were just somewhere on the floor. Fiona breathed in sharply. Look on the doors. In the light, he could see it clearly. The inside of the doors were covered in scratches, long, shallow scratches everywhere. Some of the skeletons still reached up with their limbs, still clawed at the door. It was the same on the wall by the doors. Some of the finger bones were worn down to the knuckles. These dwarves hadn't been fighting the Darkspawn. They had been trying to get out, even as the Darkspawn were battering their way in. Something had frightened them so terribly, they had tried to claw their way out with their bare hands. And then they had died. All of them at once. And the Darkspawn had died with them. Genevieve seemed transfixed by the single dwarven skeleton that sat on the throne. It seemed to recline there, in a stone chair far larger than it was, as if it had simply fallen asleep with its arms on the rests. It wore an elaborate black helmet, with small horns and an iron face guard, and black chain armour still draped across its bones. And there was not a single other corpse within thirty feet of it. The dwarves had been trying to get away from the throne. It lifted its head, its eye sockets alight with red, sinister glow. A thick power swelled in the shadows around them, a susurrus of voices in their ears as an old magic took form. You have come. The voice came from the skeleton on the dais, as well as rang out in Duncan's head. 
He could feel it slithering into his mind like an eel, like something that left a disgusting trail behind it that made him shiver. I have waited, and at last you have come. When the Dwarven Prince called to me, I granted what he desired, and I have waited in the darkness for one to take me back into the light, and you have come. Never, Genevieve shouted again, I will never. Not you. The skeleton turned now and pointed at Fiona, extending a long and bony finger at her. She skidded to a halt, gasping out loud as a liquid blackness enveloped her. It is you. The Desire Demon claims it was called by the Dwarven Prince, but Autan Taig fell only in the Exalted Age, since the palace seems to be the final stand and the demonic possession of this Prince of Autan resulted in the deaths of the Dwarves, but also the attacking Darkspawn. This leaves the true fate of the Taig a question. The Darkspawn did eventually take the Taig, but perhaps that was simply because there was no one left. And if the Darkspawn did take over the Taig properly, how did the spiders get in? Autan Taig definitely came under attack, as there are battle sites and barricades still standing in the crumbled streets, and the gates out of the Taig have been battered down by ogres. But the Darkspawn did not necessarily win on their own. More importantly, Autan Taig was never really lost. The Legion of the Dead has known about its location all along, and as they actively avoid it because of the spiders. All this just adds to the further mystery of the Taig. And if it wasn't strange enough, in Dragon Age Origins were given even more weird magic to contend with in regards to this tag. The side quest asunder culminates in this tag, and this is deliberately revealed as an elven ritual to us old magic in the notes of Shaper Axis. The ritual was very specific, as such things probably should be. Torso, head, and limbs spread amongst the deep roads to prevent the creature from returning. Looks like they died during the cutting, but we can fulfill the last part in their stead. I'm not familiar with the elven ritual, why would I be? But it seems pretty straightforward. Simple enough. This magic stuff doesn't seem that complicated. The quest requires the player to gather all the bags of body parts and take them to a place called the Altar of Sundering, which is one of the places of power. The altar is covered in runes which you should not be able to speak, but the meaning swims into your head as though whispered. The limbs may meet, the torso but a vessel, the head all but unnecessary. The heart separate keeps life. The heart safe from the blade can be restored. The heart waits in the fade. This strange meaning swimming into your head with whispers nonsense is strangely reminiscent of the veil fire runes that you can see all over Dragon Age Inquisition. But particularly of those that are located in the Temple of Mythal, whose meaning only becomes clear once you have drunk from Mythal's Well of Sorrows. And the similarities to strange elven magic doesn't stop there. The Altar of Sundering itself appears in only one other location in the game, and that is in the ruins of the Brasilian Forest, where it is used to free the soul of an arcane warrior from the life gem containing its spirit. More than that, we have another example of this exact elven ritual, and that is within the Temple of Durthamen, where the priests of the Old Creator sacrifice the High Keeper, turning him into a despair demon. His mind which cannot think, his tongue which cannot speak, his hands which cannot touch, his ears which cannot hear, his eyes which cannot see. And thus shall I highest one be bound, he shall join us in our silence. For his heart, for his heart, our highest one is bound. The secret that he keeps, he keeps with us. The vigil that he keeps, he keeps with us. His fear will not weaken us, no one shall come, dear mentor. In our eternity only darkness reigns. The ritual at the Temple of Durthamon was enacted after the creators fell silent, which likely means at the formation of the Vale, when they were sealed away from the world and Elvenon was destroyed. This ritual is an ancient one, and while we do not know how long ago the ritual in Autan took place, we do know that the Brazilian Forest Arcane Warrior also dates back to a similar time period, meaning the Altar of Sundering itself is likely just as old. So Autan Taig is an incredibly weird place, full of incredibly weird mysteries, incredibly weird magic, too many elven things, and lots of creativity. Since the Dwarven Kingdoms have lost so much of their history, each new piece of information uncovers a great many more mysteries. Autan, despite its sheer number of sources, is arguably one of the largest of those mysteries, with an unspecified lifespan and the capacity to resist the Darkspawn, both with magic runes and with magic itself. Artan's proximity to the Titan Adhedron has resulted in a rich creative history and potentially the capacity for dwarves to practice magic as well did it, though this is getting close to a realm of speculation. 
Otan Taig is often treated as a waypoint to other destinations, like Bunamar for the Grey Warden in Dragon Age Origins, Gwarin for King Marek, Rowan and Loghain in The Stolen Throne, and Kulbaris by Genevieve and her Grey Wardens in The Calling. But to treat Otan as merely a stop along the way is to ignore all the ways it truly does stand as a mighty and impressive and sophisticated example of all the Dwarven Empire once truly was, grand, filled with palaces and ideas and strength, capable of magic and might, and with so many mysteries yet to be uncovered. And so, on that note, we take our leave of Ortan Taig, and travel deeper into the mysteries of the Deep Roads. That's it for me, guys. Thank you for watching. I trust Naltunja. May you always find your way in the dark. Hi guys, Hiver Reigns here. YouTube's most recent crackdown is making it very difficult to upload videos, maintain a channel, and fund any of these endeavours. It's now impossible to provide links to sites like Patreon that you can click from the video itself, and my view count is not high enough to qualify for YouTube advertising opportunities or to even actually speak to anyone if there are problems. These things are still in flux at Google, meaning it looks like they'll continue getting worse. So if you like my content and you want to see more, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. That platform is far more stable for me. There's additional contact there for those of you who enjoy the theories and lore. Patreon support starts as low as $1 per month and every little bit helps. So if that's something you can contribute to, then please go look at the patreon.com slash reigns. On that note, special thanks to my current Patreon supporters, without whom content like this would not exist.